Hi, y'all. Not too loud? Good to get it there. Yes, yes, everyone hear me? Amazing. Hi, my name is McKenna Kukla, and I am a second year focused missionary here at the University of Mizzou. So you might be asking what focused missionary is, and in brief, it's just I get to enter into people's lives, whether they're the most Catholic person I've ever met, Christian, or far, far away from ever touching this human center. I get to hear their stories, learn their life, and speak truth into, into what they're experiencing. I get to share the truth of the gospel. And it's the best job in the entire world. Now, the last time that I was on the stage right here, I told um, the audience, per se, that I have a strong addiction to something. Some of you might know. No, it's not Sparky's, but also, yes, it's avocados. I'm extremely addicted. But what a lot of people don't know is that I'm actually addicted to all fruit. I will say that avocados are fruit, bite me, but it stemmed from a very young age. I remember when I was in grade school, my parents, you know, most parents had to sit their kids down and say, you have to eat the fruit before it goes bad. And they would look and have one-on-one -on -one conversation with me on how you need to save the fruit for other people. <laughs> now, I would come home and like, I'm not talking about all these, you know, they have like a big blueberry thing. I'm talking about like, my mom would go and get the huge thing from Costco of strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, Mango's yeah, but like I eat it all. <laughs> and one particular day, I came back fourth grade, and I was a little stressed. I had a quiz the next day. I study for it. Come back, I pop open that blueberry cup, and I start picking, eating, going. Then later on, I kind of finish up my studying. I move to the TV, picking, eating, going. And then later on, before dinner, I'm feeling well. I'm still hungry. Metabolism, you know? And uh, I'm like, I'm about to pick, eat up, and then the thing was gone. And uh, I'll tell you this. I thought that I had beat out the blueberries, but the blueberries done got me. <laughs> because you can imagine where I was the rest of the night. It wasn't pretty, and it was the most painful night of my young experience. You see, I thought that I could break the rule. I saw, oh my gosh, blueberries taste really good and they're nutritious. Like I see on every food pyramid how many fruits you're supposed to eat. Um, and I didn't understand why there could be a limit, but the law, I didn't break the law. The law broke me. Now tonight I'm going to be talking about the teaching of the apostles. And when we hear the word teaching, a lot of times we think, what are the rules that I have to follow? <coughs> Obviously, they chose me from this talk because, as you can tell, I'm not very good at following the teachings or the laws. So I'm the perfect person to tell you about all the teachings and laws that the apostles would to pass down. But what does it even mean, teaching of the apostles? Well, what we want to be taught is the truth. We don't want to follow something that isn't true. We want to follow the commandments that lead to truth. I was thinking about all of this, and I was like, I don't know, teaching on the apostles is pretty broad. And I turned to my boy, Paul. And he's writing to the Romans, and he says this. But thanks be to God, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed Obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Now, when I read that, my heart was moved because Paul talked about an interior transformation, something occurring in our heart, resulting in a commitment that they made. Because what we commit to is what we become. I commit myself to my grades, to my activities, to my friends, to my social life, and ultimately, that results in how I live my life and who I eventually become. Now, the world offers us every sort of commitment, every sort of truth, right? That around the corner is the next weight loss promotion that this will solve your life. This is the truth. This will change everything. So many things that we're learning at university, the next political idea or revolutionary product is going to change our life and it offers us so many truths Yet it isn't enough to satisfy us. And so we're ultimately longing for the real answer, the real question we're all stirring for, me included, is what is truth? 
There's a man that asked this in the Bible. His name is Pontius Pilate. He was the man that um, stood before Jesus, before his passion, and had the choice either to go with the crowd and crucify him or hold him back. And stirred by so many emotions and so much confusion, he stood in front of Jesus and asked, what is truth? Jesus stood there and looked at him. I think there's a lot of different natural responses to that question, what is truth? I think my natural inclination is, well, I get to determine truth. There's maybe like three different areas, reject truth, really, really accept it, and then kind of just choose it. And I say, well, I'm intelligent. I can discern for myself. I'm going to choose what truth is. I call this uh, the cafeteria Christian, the cafeteria Catholic. You take some over here, you skip, you know, the green beans, but then you come in for the hot rolls, and you're like wanting all of it. You get to pick and choose what is convenient for you. Now, what really struck me when I recognized this was part of my heart, I actually was on a spring break trip with my friends senior year, and we drove up to Washington, D.C., and actually stopped at the Bible Museum. And at this Bible Museum, there's a particular Bible that stood out to me. I'd never seen it before. It was actually Thomas Jefferson's Bible, yes, the man on the $2 bill. <laughs> really relevant. He uses it a lot nowadays. He owned a Bible, but what he did is any part that wasn't convenient to his own morality or values, he actually cut out. So he cut out all the miracles that Jesus had because it couldn't quite sell within the scientific notion of it. He cut out anything regarding not having slaves because he wanted the convenience of owning slaves at the time. And I, I saw it, and I go, man, that's radical. And the more I sat with it, the more I recognized that's what I do with my every life. You see, St. Augustine has a saying about this. He says this, people hate the truth for the sake of whatever it is that they love more than the truth. They love truth when it shines warmly on them and hate it when it refused them. I really love the mercy of God when I've sinned really bad, and I want an excuse to continue doing it. But, oh my gosh, this person who wronged me, do you, can you believe what they did? Are you going to have justice on them, God? Come on. When it's convenient to me, I want it. And this goes with all the laws and commandments. I might be sitting at E3 or maybe go even weekly to a Bible study, but when it's not convenient, and the laws aren't convenient, when it's not convenient um, to follow them, then I don't want it. Yeah, I'll go get drunk on the weekends. Yeah, I'll go sleep with my boyfriend. It's not that bad. He loves me. You see, if you don't trust the teaching, it's because you don't trust the teacher. If you don't trust the teaching, it's because you don't trust the teacher. If you question and choose against the teaching of what is true, if you question and choose against the teacher and who is truth. It's really easy for me to believe that there's a creator that created everything, but it's really more difficult for me to believe that he could be father. Or maybe I've grown up Christian my entire life, and it's pretty simple to understand that God could be my father, but I don't think I believe that my father is good. Always. See, this identity shift and what we believe are the teachings causes this identity shift of God. We claim him as different people or a different identity than who he truly is. Our view is distorted and it leads us to two extremes. Either we have the classic teaching of the apostles kid that, you know, this person never shows up to church. They find the rules oppressing and they start running the other way not being touched by God. That's inconvenient. Or we have the kid that has always done everything right. God bless these people, the people that literally love the rules because their hearts are inclined to something so good, yet they still have a distorted vision of who God is because they see him as a person that rewards good things rather than who they are. I'll start off first with... Um, 
kind of the typical person when we think of when we think of someone that doesn't follow the teaching of the apostles too well. Teaching of the church, the teaching of God. This person doesn't want to be oppressed by the laws, and so they find their own way. They have so much desire that they want to follow it. It's amazing. <laughs> but it brings me back to a moment when I was in the fifth grade, and I went on my family's favorite vacation. We went to the Grand Tetons. There's beautiful views, hiking, and mountains. And so I'm going down this path on a hike, and I see a really cool bouldering rock off to the left. So I immediately sprint over while my mom's like, yeah! <laughs> but what I saw was so good. And she's like, you got, you got to stay on the path. I'm going up. And I go over here, and I see all the flowers. I'm like, look how pretty. And get over here. Actually, it was particularly the grill huckleberries there, wild huckleberries. So I was trying to eat the fruit. Again, you can see the thing. Um, <laughs> and we are on the path. Um, you see, God doesn't give us laws to shun us. He gives us guidelines to bring us to who we are. But I didn't understand why my mom kept calling me back to the path until I got to the end. Because on the end, I saw everything. I saw the mountains. I saw the sky. I saw that bouldering walk down there. I saw the flowers. I saw it all. It was the fulfillment of everything in abundance. God wants us to be on the way because he wants to give us more than we could have dreamed of. It's not that those things are bad. It's that he has a direction of where he's bringing us to life. When we think in these direct ways, well, <laughs> it's really inconvenient not to get drunk with my friends. It's not that God just wants to ruin your life. It's that he's saying, no, McKenna, you don't understand. When you get to that state of intoxication, you can't perceive truth. You can't perceive my love. Because that's the truth. You see, it's like... <laughs> God has created us not just good, but very good. He's not just created us to be a Toyota, but a Ferrari. And we all know that you don't put unleaded gas in a Ferrari. It probably run for a little bit, but eventually, eventually the engine will run down. It needs premium gas. And the Lord's just trying to guide us to that, to run well, to run better than we could have ever imagined. Now, that's one side of it. A person that has so much desire that they want it all, they're finding it all, but yet it's not enough. Then we have the person that um, most people wouldn't think of when it comes to teaching the apostles. We have the person who might be doing all the things, might be leading the retreats, by becoming, by having the perfect attendance to eat free, by be leading their own Bible study, and heck, maybe even going to daily mass. See, all of these things are good things, but when it becomes about all the things, it turns out that heart can be just as hardened. There's a man in the Bible that talks about this. His name is Jesus. He talks about it. It's a man called the rich young man. A lot of you guys have heard this story, but I want to read it to you now. I find myself here. And as he was settling, setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, <laughs> all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. He said to him, You like one thing. Go. 
sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. At this thing, his countenance fell. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, this man didn't have bad intentions, but he didn't come to really know Jesus. He came to show him all of the affirmations, all of the achievements, all of the things. He wanted to be seen. He wanted to be known. Jesus invites him to go sell all he has, and in a real radical way, he probably is calling him to physical poverty. But in a deeper spiritual way, he's saying, go sell all of your achievements. So all the things that are keeping me from knowing who you truly are, I want to enter into your life. I want to enter into your poverty. I want to know you. Will you let me in? I think there's a lot of people in this room that might relate to that. I just got off of an hour phone call where a priest friend called me out on that. He just asked, kind of, Aren't you exhausted? See, when I signed up for this talk, you know, it's about Acts 2.42, I knew that teaching of the apostles was kind of the catch-all, be-all. We have the breaking of the bread, we have the prayers, we have the fellowship, which I could see pretty clearly of, of things, and we have the catch-all of the teaching of the apostles. And... I wanted to give a little backdrop to this. So I don't know if you guys know a lot about Acts chapter 2, but it's one of my favorite chapters. At this point, Peter comes in and he's very excited. He's just received the Holy Spirit in Pentecost and is fired up. He goes to the front of the stage and all of the apostles and people are going wild. And he says, my favorite quote in all the Bible, we are not drunk as you suppose. It was only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now, from there, he actually launches into the most beautiful gospel presentation I've ever heard. He walks through salvation history. He walks through David and the covenants and says, there is a man even greater than this. There is a man that knows you and loves you and is God. Actually, you've crucified him. The people began to freak out when they found out that they crucified Jesus, the person who had fulfilled everything. And freaking out, they come to Peter and say, cut to the heart, they say, what are we to do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent, come, bear your poverty, Put Jesus in, be vulnerable, admit to your sins, and hope, dare to hope for your resurrection. And they come, they enter, and they bring their friends. They can't help but to bring friends into this joy of this resurrection. But how do they continue to live that? How do they continue to live the gospel message? It's through Acts 2.42. It's through the breaking of the bread, the teaching of the apostles, the fellowship, and the prayer. You see, the teaching on the apostles, when I hear it that way, and it's a part of the way to live the gospel, I'm like, wow, dang, that's really important. Our rule is really that important, and holy cow, I've messed up a lot. And I think of the Jewish people at that time that had to, be, <laughs> had to follow 613 laws. I can barely follow the 10. 613 laws, yet... Peter proclaims something new, something totally radical. And what does God say? In John chapter 12, he says, there is only one commandment that you must follow. And it's this. This commandment is eternal life. The one commandment that we have to follow, the one teaching of the apostles that they would pass down to the church is eternal life. Later in John, it says this. For this is eternal life, to know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's to be in union with God. 
It's to be in relationship with God. It's the one commandment. God has made you for himself. He was totally satisfied in and of himself. He would be totally whole, but love could not contain itself, and it releases itself out to create you individually. He wants relationship with you, and he walked with you in the cool of the day. He called you my child. Yeah, in the hardness of our hearts, well, there it was, I can't understand you, God. You are a ruler. I don't want your oppressive teachings and laws that are going to keep me from being alive. Or whether it was the person that said, Oh, yes, Lord, I know all of the rules. I can do all the things for you, but don't get close to me. Don't look at me. Don't get too close. You might actually see who I really am. You see, because sin... When we commit it and we point and claim an identity of God that isn't him, say, you're not my father, it breaks us from that relationship. It doesn't just break us from him, it kills us. Because, you see, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So when we separate ourselves from the life, we end up dead. Being a dead person is a lot worse than being a bad person. can't fix yourself if you're dead. Someone needs to bring you back to life. And thank God we have a father that even though we say that you are a dictator, you are a ruler, you, you won't want anything to do with me. God in that moment looks at us, never breaks the gaze with us and says, my child, my child, my child, you are mine. I see you and I know you and I love you so much so that I will trade my own child for you. I will send down my own son to take the wages of your sin, which is death, and bring you to eternal life, to unity with me. Would you just let me in? Would you let me know you? See, we could have all the laws and all the things that we have written out and try enough to do it, or we can receive the truth of the one commandment that we are made for eternal life. Relationship with God. Are we letting the words, his law of love, be inscribed upon our hearts? Pontius Pilate stood there before Jesus and asked the question, what is truth. What is truth? Jesus says, and the way, the truth, and the life. He was standing before truth and by himself. Yet Pilate was afraid because it might cost too much. What people might say well, he really accepts me, he sees who I really am. The cost was large. Truth wasn't convenient, but he let Jesus go. See, the cost of truth is our vulnerability, is our poverty. But our poverty is our capacity to receive him. Our poverty, our brokenness, is our greatest wealth. So there's nothing Jesus is more attractive to. We can pick and choose the teachings of truth, but ultimately we're picking and choosing why identities of God we want of Him, and ultimately the identities that we plan for ourselves. I don't like the teaching that. I can't just work out all of my good works so I can end up in heaven. It'd be much easier if I could do that. Being vulnerable is too scary for me, God. I don't like the truth that I can't get drunk with my friends on the weekends because, God, that's a really inconvenient law. Do you want me to be unhappy? Do you want me to be alone? 
ultimately leading maybe partially to a deeper line in your own heart, I'm unlovable. No one would want to choose me. Am I good enough? You see, I spent a summer in India working with the course of the poor, the missionaries of charity. Mother Teresa started this order and she had the audacity to say to her sisters, you gave up everything. I worry that some of you still have not really met Jesus. I think a lot of us have done a lot of things. We're here at E3, we're listening to great talks. But she had the audacity to tell some of her sisters these things who had gave up her, their entire life to serve the poor, move away from their family. She had the audacity to say that to them. I'm going to have the audacity to invite you to consider this for yourself. I worry that some of you have not truly met Jesus one to one. You and him alone. Jesus wants me to tell you again how much is the love he has for each one of you beyond all that you can imagine. You may spend time in chapel, but have you seen with the eye of your soul how he looks at you with love? Do you really know the living Jesus, not from books, but from being with him in your heart? Have you heard the loving words he speaks to you? I want to invite you to know Jesus one to one. Not just today, but every day. I want this gospel message not just to be life enhancing, life bettering, but life transforming. If you leave this talk and think that this was really nice, that's good. But we can go to a lot of nice things. When is it going to hit you? When is it going to sink in? Jesus wants to be yours. So I want to invite you, how do we live this one-to-one? -one? We surrender. We get a little less nitpicky about all the teachings, and we say, do I trust the teacher? Do I dare to hope, dare to trust? So I want to invite you now to prayer with me. I want to invite you to know him, to not hide from him, to hear him, speak to you but in a real way, just like the rich young man or like Pilate, have Jesus look at you one to one, looking at you and loving you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I invite you to close your eyes and place out your hands open in front of you in a place of surrender. God, Father, at times it's scary to know you, not to attempt to. There's a lot of things I hear about you. I know there's a lot of things I've done for you. There's a lot of places in my heart that don't know you. I'm not even sure if I want to know you. I ask God, give me the courage not hide anymore. Know the one truth, one teaching of your love, eternal life that I made for union with you. God, I offer you my struggle, my insecurity, the lies I believe about you and about myself. I lay them down before you. Proclaim the truth that you want to see me, that I can come out of hiding, out of shame, to be yours, to be one with you. I encourage you to keep your eyes closed, have your hand and hands open, and to let Jesus speak over you. Let him speak his love to you and invite you 
out of yourselves and into the cave. Oh, 